Good morning. I'm glad everybody's here. We had a good uh, registration uh, returns. We had over 22 people who signed up for this program today. Uh, this program is, is going to be talking a little bit about uh, some of the regulations and, and food safety aspect on, on uh, small scale aquaponics and, and hydroponics units that we need to be aware of so we can mitigate any kind of uh, pathogens, human pathogens that may be in the system so we don't have uh, food that are contaminated with E. coli, listeria, salmonella, that can get out so we can do uh, produce safe and healthy food for the our consumers out there. So we have three presentations today. Uh, the first one is going to be on aquaponics and hydroponics and FISMA regulation by Dr. Laurel Trump, associate professor, extension specialist at Virginia Tech, followed by Riza. Ovisapur, I hope I got your name, Riza. He's going to do a food safety program for aquaponics. And at last is Dr. Kim is going to present some of the stuff that you've been working on. We've been going out doing some surveys of small scale aquaponics and hydroponic units uh, out there throughout the state. We've been all over the state, haven't we, Dr. Kim? Yeah, yes. So he's going to produce, uh, cover some of the research data that we have collected so far. So with that, uh, Dr. Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can present your program. Each of you got about 20 minutes. So don't let that be a hindrance. Uh, we've gone over a little bit on these programs. So uh, it's all yours now. Perfect. And all of you can see my slides and yeah. hear me today? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry, I have a Roomba in the background that keeps turning on, so. All right, today I wanted to kind of give you guys just a really quick um, overview of the Food Safety Modernization Act, specifically the produce safety rule, because I believe that is the one um, for aquaponics and hydroponic operations that you may encounter. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the regulatory requirements specific to that. Um, and it's actually not terrible. So I'm hoping that with this 20 minutes, I can give you a nice overview, um, some information. And then also, if you think any of this applies to you, um, you have so many people on the phone, as well as myself and Dr. Visiapur, Dr. Kim, who would be more than happy to kind of walk you through the specifics or uh, whatnot to your operation. So with that, the Food Safety Modernization Act, as FISMA is the acronym you guys probably most hear. Um, this is really the biggest revamp to our food safety um, in this country um, in about 70 plus years since the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. And it really shifts um, our food supply to be more of let's prevent this, right? Uh, that versus responding. So much um, of our food safety in this country has been responding to outbreaks. Um, whether that be uh, something um, in like 1993 where we saw Jack in a Box with all the um, E. coli 0157H7 infections due to undercooked uh, hamburgers, where now we see um, it's very important to cook your hamburger meat, um, and we see a lot of regula regulations that came out of that. Um, we're really going towards more of that preventative framework. I tell people all the time, it's sort of like putting on a seatbelt when you drive a car. Um, there are seven regulations that are part of FISMA. Um, they span every aspect or corner of uh, food safety or food in this country, all the way from produce safety, which would be, you know, growing um, and packing, holding different things for produce, uh, to uh, preventive controls for human foods, animal food, foreign supplier verification rule, um, third party accreditation, sanitary tra transport. Um, and adulteration of food. So it really encompasses everything. And again, it was all about shifting that framework to prevention. Let's think about it before it happens. And that will hopefully make us not have these large scale issues. As when we see some of these contamination issues, um, really it's a lot of things that go wrong, not just one little mistake, it's several mistakes. So the produce safety rule in 
particular um, is really uh, basically the first time ever that produce has been regulated in this country before it was all voluntary. It's a science-based minimum standards for the safe growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of produce. Um, it addresses several major areas from worker training, health and hygiene, to water, to biological soil amendments of animal origin, um, animals, equipment, tools, and buildings, as well as some other things. Um, and if this sounds a little bit similar to GAP, which would be good agricultural practices, it is. It is very similar. The foundational practices and principles are very, very similar. However, this is not a GAP certification. Unlike GAP, the FSMA Produce Safety Rule is a federal regulation. We're gonna talk about kind of how it's mandated in Virginia, but um, it's actually um, a Food and Drug Administration FDA um, regulation. GAP, uh, Good Agricultural Practices, is a third party audit system. Um, it's voluntary, it's required often by buyers. So I think that's where sometimes people think it is mandatory, but it's not. You don't, know, you don't have to have a GAP audit. That that means that you don't have to sell to that person. Um, but this is typically something, like I said, that's mandated by buyers, um, asked of by buyers, uh, and it really opens up your market access. So something to think about. The FSMA produce safety rule, um, like I said, while they have uh, overlapping elements, this is really the floor or the foundation of your house for food safety. Um, anything in terms of gap or getting more complex, those are really just other levels, right? Putting on a second story of your home. So how do you even know if the produce safety rule affects you? Um, that would be a completely entire lecture on its own, but um, typically uh, you fall either into you're covered fully by the rule, you're exempt where you don't have to worry about the rule at all, or you're this qualified exempt category. And there's two things I'm gonna draw your attention to. One, there's the FDA coverage and exemptions flowchart. However, VCE or Virginia Cooperative Extension has really decided to make this even easier um, for uh, folks to figure out. We've developed a Qualtrics survey. Um, Stuart Burmack um, put that together um, with a team. We have it in English and Spanish. You can take this survey online. It walks you through your operation and it'll let you know at the end where do you fall? Are you covered? Are you exempt? Are you qualified exempt? We also have this uh, uh, is a paper copy if you'd like to print it out or contact one of your local agents to print it out for you and walk it through. I'm happy to do this with you as well. So those links are on the screen and I'm also happy to share this presentation or post it online. Um, here is just a really quick snapshot of what the um, FDA, that's the color one with the gold, red, and gray. Uh, that's the FDA flow chart, as well as you can see our Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, it's very smartphone friendly, um, and we have a lot of resources for FSMA if you are uh, in fact covered by the regulation or in that middle category where you're kind of covered, but not really. How is the produce safety rule regulated in Virginia? Well, like I said, it is under FDA's authority. However, uh, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, VDACS, has established an agreement with FDA um, and passed legislation a couple years ago where they are gonna do the enforcements in Virginia. This is fantastic news for Virginians um, because it allows us to work with um, locals uh, where market access and, uh, you know, Virginia grown and the uh, economics of actually growing and producing food is so important, right? So uh, VDAX, I've worked with several of their staff. They are very friendly, um, all about education before regulation. Um, and they're, it's, it's a great thing for Virginia. And the inspections that they've done thus far have been very, very successful. Um, I've also included a link uh, to their produce safety program. Um, and on this next page, I've also included um, some direct contacts. Uh, Eric Bungo is the program supervisor and McGee is the assistant program supervisor. Um, they are very, very friendly. They have a lot of forms and information um, and resources on their webpage. Um, this is just a snapshot of a resource uh, that would help you figure out where 
are you covered, are you not? And then if you fall into that category where you may only be partially covered uh, or you're exempt, you can actually have this form on hand and do a, a annual um, check to say, uh, to make sure that you're still in the right category. So it's very, very nice. And again, there are a whole host of extension agents around the Commonwealth that are very familiar with uh, helping you figure out and determining your status and then what you need to do. In terms of the compliance dates, um, if this is the first time you've heard of it, no big deal. Um, you're probably, um, because you haven't heard about it, might be on more of the smaller side and that's sort of where we're seeing, uh, we just started enforcement on that in 2020. Um, they won't actually start real inspections until 2021. So, and that is important to know that just because of what's going on with COVID, they are still uh, very focused on food safety. So I had someone ask me recently, well, with everything with COVID, are we kind of not caring about food safety? Um, that's not true. We're still very much concerned with food safety and having different um, issues and, you know, focusing on that. Um, but you can see if you're a very large business where you bring in over a half a million dollars a year, they've already um, had inspectors. Inspections. Um, they're probably now on their second or third inspection, um, but the very small businesses, which are that 25,000 to 250,000 range, they will um, just be starting to get involved in it. So if this is the first time you've heard of it, um, it'd be really great um, if you think it's um, something that applies to you or you want to learn more about food safety. Um, I'm going to talk to you at the very end about a class we have coming up in November, which is going to be held all virtually, um, where you can learn all about the specifics and ins and outs of this regulation, what you need to do. And even if it doesn't apply to you right now, you never know, your business could grow to where you might be over um, those financial thresh thresholds um, where you might need it. And it's a really great class and we offer it at a really nice discounted rates right now in Virginia. So I'll give a pitch on that later. So let's talk a little bit about what is that rule, um, the produce safety rule say about aquaponics operations. Um, and there's not a whole lot, right? They focus a lot on growing crops um, in traditional uh, uh, outside mediums, fields, a lot of greenhouse, um, uh, production, um, but they do mention uh, aquaponics and hydroponic operations and there's really a couple things uh, that they key in on and that's what I want to highlight for you all today to just start thinking about. So, uh, like I said, they're not excluded from the rule. That was one misnomer is that aquaponics, you don't have to worry about produce safety, but if you are growing produce, absolutely, this is something that you do need to think about if you are potentially um, covered by, by the rule. Um, there is no specific section for aquaponics. You have to kind of go on a little bit of a hunt and find uh, mission. Um, but again, I'm gonna make it really easy for you and, and show you all the, the certain parts that you need to care about. Um, sprouts, if you are growing sprouts, they actually do break out sprouts. It's its own sec separate sub part in the rule and they actually have their own specific sprout classes. Um, for food safety because sprouts um, are considered a bit more higher risk. Here are the preamble comments um, where FDA addresses aquaponics and hydroponic operations. But again, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version uh, today. But if you uh, like to see that codified language, um, this will make it easy for you to find. So let's talk about FDA's comments on fish. Um, FDA got a lot of comments uh, from different folks um, that fish do not carry E. coli. And that's one of the things today that I wanted to um, kind of put that myth uh, to bed. FDA has shown data as well as other literature that fish can become carriers of human pathogens, including some of those that Dr. Crosby mentioned in the introductory talk. Um, some pathogenic E. coli, uh, salmonella, and if, especially if they're exposed to these contaminated um, types of products. It could be uh, the water's contaminated and the fish uh, pick it up that way. It could be sediment. It also could be uh, feed. So it's also very important to think about um, things that those fish could be exposed to and why it's important to minimize cross-contamination. But because we know that fish, like other animals, 
could in fact become carriers of these human pathogens. This is why it kind of all plays into making sure that they don't um, have any potential cross-contamination with that produce being grown in those systems. So the subparts uh, specifically uh, with aquaponics comments, I mentioned there's three of them, agricultural water, biological soil amendments, and domesticated animals and wild animals. And I'm gonna give you just a really quick overview of what each of those has to say about an aquaponic or hydroponic operation. So when it comes to agricultural water, this doesn't matter really what your, uh, what your system is. Um, it's all about understanding if you meet the definition of agricultural water and um, does it apply to you. So agricultural water um, under the rule means water used in covered activities on covered produce where water is intended to or likely to contact covered produce or food contact surfaces. So there is a quite a extensive list of covered produce. There's only about 34 commodities that are not covered, but any kinds of leafy greens, strawberries, things that are likely consumed raw are typically covered produce. Covered activities are really growing, the harvesting, the packing, um, all those typical things that we would do to grow um, and produce good wholesome food. Is the water likely to come in contact? This is the big question, right? And you could make the case that it's not, but I'll give you some things to think about. Um, you really have to think about your system and if anything goes wrong in it, could that water come in contact with that product? And if it does, then it would fall under agricultural water and you'd need to follow the requirements. So like I mentioned, um, covered activities, uh, all about just growing, harvesting, packing, covered produce. Um, they do define it in the rule and you can see a list of, of commodities, but it's typically anything that's normally consumed raw, um, strawberries, apples, carrots. Um, to fit the definition of agricultural water, it's gotta come in direct contact with that harvestable portion of the produce. So we're not talking about the roots. Um, so if you have something like a system with a raft where you might have the leafy greens growing on top with the roots exposed to the water. If you can ensure that that water is not gonna come into contact, then maybe agricultural, you don't meet the definition of agricultural water. Um, so this is where you have to really think about your system and the potential risks. And these are the things that I want you to think about when you decide, do I meet that definition of agricultural water? Um, are you spraying produce, mist, overhead applications? It would be agricultural water. Are you inspecting your system to ensure no leaks, sprays? Can water uh, potentially come into contact if there's an issue? How, when you harvest or pack, would it ever come into contact? So oftentimes you might lift up the raft um, and that's a, a potential cross-contamination there where that water could come into contact with the other growing uh, produce on the other rafts. Potential contamination from fish, splashing water, uh, again, depends on your system. So really important to think about, do you meet that definition of agricultural water? If you do, then what do you have to do? You have to make sure your water has zero detectable generic E. coli. And then there are some testing frequencies, but right now they are under consideration at FDA. Um, so right now we would just want you to be testing maybe once during the season or at the beginning or the end. And I would really defer to Dr. Ravisiapur and Dr. Kim for those specific uh, recommendations, maybe based on some of their research. With biological soil amendments, this is subpart F, um, they basically say liquid only matrices, uh, they're not growth media, they're gonna be kind of under your agricultural water because they're liquid. Um, any growing substrates um, that would include like raw animal manures, things like that, they um, might fall under biological soil amendments of animal origin, um, but most growing substrates that I've reviewed uh, do not really include um, what they would define as a biological soil amendment of animal origin, which would be those raw animal products that haven't been uh, treated. Also for domesticated and wild animals, um, this typically, um, when you think of a field being grown uh, outside, that makes perfect sense, right? You're gonna have animal intrusion and whatnot. If you're in a greenhouse, you're probably thinking of, of pest management. Um, this really um, is basically if you're being, if it's grown outdoors at all, it's grown in a partially enclosed building, um, 
you're going to need to think about domesticated wild animals because they could potentially get in. If your aquaponic system is in a fully enclosed building, this doesn't apply to you. Um, and that's mostly because you can control um, what comes and goes and you'll be focusing more on uh, sanitary practices in that type of facility. And it doesn't necessarily also apply to the fish. Clearly they're there for a purpose. Um, so they're, they're not considered any type of animal under this subpar. But you do have to think about the risks from fish in that agricultural water uh, section that we spoke uh, quite a bit about. So our kind of summary and take home message, um, since this was sort of our really quick uh, overview in 20 minutes, um, is that aquaponics and hydroponic operations, they're not excluded from the FSMA produce safety rule. Um, it's really important, whether you are very small or um, a different uh, size, medium, large, to determine if your operation is covered, um, please use those Virginia Cooperative Extension resources to help decide. Um, again, you can do a paper uh, survey that walks you through it, asks you some questions. It's really nice. You can do it on your uh, smartphone if that is uh, something that's available to you. Um, and this way you'll know, right? And you'll kind of know, what do I need to do? If you think that you may be uh, covered, it is really important to get into one of our Produce Safety Alliance classes. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. It's also important to determine um, if your operation uses agricultural water as defined by the FDA. So we talked about under the FDA uh, Produce Safety Rule, FISMA, agricultural water is de de defined by coming into contact with a food contact surface or that harvestable portion of your produce. So you have to really think about how am I using my water in my operation and does it meet that agricultural water definition? If it does, there are things that you need to do. This is very different, by the way, than good agricultural practices because good agricultural practices like an audit, which would be voluntary, something you sign up for that you want to increase your market, they always require some type of water testing. It doesn't matter if it comes into contact or not. That is not how they define agricultural water. Um, and so if you're interested in uh, pursuing GAP, um, I know Dr. Visiopore has some great resources. And uh, my other colleague, Amber Velot, also has a mentoring program to walk you through those steps. So FISMA compliance has several parts. But if you're covered, we have lots of resources and educational materials um, and people to assist you in Virginia. Um, here's also some really interesting, um, good information uh, as well on the resource tab. Um, and with, uh, gosh, just like the last 30 seconds I have, I wanted to highlight, we are going to have November 10th, 11th and 12th from about two to 5 p.m. So we're hoping people can work in the morning um, and then take a little break in that late afternoon uh, window. We're gonna host a produce safety rule training class. It's in a virtual format. This is an official training uh, class approved by the FDA. When you attend this, basically it's about eight hours of instruction, um, you get a certificate. The certificate is good for life. Um, it follows the person. So if you um, start an operation and then move to a different operation or whatnot, that certificate goes with you. It is yours, uh, again, it's good for life. Um, and it basically will walk you through in that eight hour class, all of the requirements for the produce safety rule, about the history, the science behind it, things you need to think about or do, and it is the only class right now approved by the FDA um, to meet uh, that training piece that you would need if you were covered under the regulation. Additionally, the course includes a really nice food safety uh, manual or educational manual. Um, it's, of course, going to be mailed to your home since it's in a virtual format. Um, and then you would, you know, you'll need to Zoom online, sort of like we're doing today. But the manual is really nice. Um, if you think that you may be interested in any other type of food safety um, program, this gives you a great foundational base. Um, so I really encourage you, if you're interested in this training class, please email me. Um, we will have our registration go live towards uh, the middle uh, to the end of September. And again, it is a great opportunity um, 
in Virginia, we typically cover the cost of the certificates and the training manuals. That's at least an $85 value that you get for free. Um, I think right now for the class, we're just going to be charging uh, the postage and a little bit of printing for the materials. So it might be like 30 bucks um, total, um, which again, these classes in other states, because they're all being offered the same. Uh, some of them, if they have grants, are being offered less, but I know in California, you can see these classes upwards to $500. With that, um, thank you, and I'll take any questions, um, but I know my colleagues are going to do a really great job setting you guys up for uh, the next uh, couple phases. Uh, Lawrence, thank you so much. I think we're going to go ahead and move through all the talks and just have questions at the end to cover, so well, that way we'll have plenty of time to answer all the questions that people may have. So again, thank you. It was very great. I'm going to turn it over to Risa and let him talk about uh, uh, safety plans for rock aquaponics. Uh, Risa, you're up next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Estron. Uh, I think I already shared my screen. Can you see that or? You got yeah. your screen. screen. Just, just make it. Yes, yeah, you can see. That, perfect. Does it work right now? Yeah, go to full screen with your slides. You show the next one. Try to go full screen if you can. So, yeah, I think it's, oh, okay, give me a second, then I need to stop sharing and I need to reshare that because it's on the screen too. Okay. Oh, right now. There you go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Strawn, and thank you, Dr. Crosby, for organizing the meeting. Uh, well, I'm Reza Obisi. I'm Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist at the Seafood Direct and Department of Food Science and Technology at Virginia Tech. Today, I will be talking a little bit about the food safety plans development for aquaponics system. Um, I will be talking a little bit about uh, food safety risks associated with aquaponics, some part of our research, and also we will share uh, one of our documents, uh, which is a kind of a food safety plans, comprehensive food safety plans developed by uh, Virginia Tech and uh, Washington State University, and it is available online. And we have been covering, we, we, we covered actually different, tech, uh, different aquaponics system and processing. I'll go through that and uh, we'll touch that a little bit as much as I could. But um, if you want to have access to the full document, it is available online. So um, one of the major issues that we have with aquaponics, even when we talk to the expert people, uh, since they think there is no, uh, a recall, there hasn't been any recall so far, there shouldn't be any problem with the food safety, but technically it's, it is coming from our uh, limited knowledge about this system. This system is very complicated as uh, other researchers, uh, they have been talking about that during the last couple of weeks. Uh, we have fish, bacteria, water, and plants at the same time in a system which all of these components, each of them, they have their own uh, optimum conditions uh, and they need to have their own optimum conditions, which might be different from the other component. But we need to make sure that we are keeping them uh, under the optimum condition, <clears throat> excuse me, under the optimum condition, because otherwise uh, they can go through the stressful condition and opportunistic pathogenic bacteria, they can grow easily in the system and they can cause some problem down the road. Uh, fish, we don't really um, consider them as a food safety threat in an aquaponic system because we cook them and eat them. It's not a really big deal. So uh, another, uh, another area which hasn't been addressed pretty well is the fate of the microorganisms in the system. And we should consider the natural microbiome in the system. In one of our research, uh, we were able to show that if we have a good microbial community in the system, we can get rid of the Vibrio uh, for, uh, with four log reduction within 24 hours without adding any antibiotic to the system just because of the good bacteria. They already been established in the system and they can take care of the bad bacteria. 
usually the natural microbiome, which are the good bacteria in the system, they are a slow growing bacteria. It takes months to year to develop a good microbial community system in an aquaponics or a RAS system. And pathogenic bacteria, uh, they are rapidly growing bacteria, but uh, these microbiome, they can, uh, they can uh, eat or graze on the bad bacteria and they can reduce them. So it is really important uh, to keep the system as healthy as possible to provide enough uh, oxygen, enough the temperature, optimum condition uh, to reduce uh, the prevalence of the pathogenic bacteria in the system. There are some other concerns about the regulations. Uh, some of them, they are not pretty clear. There are too many small scale producers, which I am pretty sure Dr. Kim uh, will address that. And each of them has different uh, 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 processing system or technologies, uh, which makes it very difficult to develop a specific food, uh, food safety plan for them. Um, we have some false assumption about uh, fish water and manure as Dr. Laura Strong uh, addressed that pretty well. And so the moment that the water becomes in contact with the edible part of the plants, it will be considered as agricultural water and we need to treat them. So there are so many different bacteria, viruses and protozoa in the RAS system, which we are not really concerned about them when we are talking about the rats, but uh, when we mix that with the plants, uh, these uh, pathogenic microorganisms can become a really uh, threat for the system and for the human consumption. We need to consider them. So there are two sources of pathogens in the system. Some of them, they naturally exist in the system, and some of them, they just uh, being introduced to the system because of the cross-contamination. Since we have two different types of uh, pathogenic bacteria or microorganisms in the system, uh, we can have different methods for preventing them. For naturally exist bacteria like Listeria monocytogenes, uh, we can uh, enhance the, uh, we, can keep the uh, we can keep the system as healthy as possible and the microbial community can take care of the bad bacteria. And for the cross-contamination, we can apply different preventive control, sanitation, training to reduce that. There are different sections in an aquaponic system uh, which might be uh, uh, the source of uh, contaminations, the uh, equipments, the new fish that we are introducing to the system, uh, the bad bacteria or the bad microbial community in the system. If we don't provide enough oxygen, for example, for microbial community in the biofilters, uh, technically so, uh, they cannot take care of the bad bacteria in the system. Feed is another source of cross-contamination. They can introduce different types of pathogens into the system. Uh, feed needs to be purchased from the uh, accredited uh, companies. Uh, uh, we need to keep them under the optimal and proper condition. And we need to keep the pest away from the system because they can be another source of cross-contamination. And also we need to provide enough training for the uh, workers. Uh, water sanitation is one of the most important things technically. So there are different methods of water sanitation, UV or ozone in an aquaponic system could be used when we are transferring the water from the aquaculture section to the plant part. Proper hand washing and training for uh, workers in the plants, um, pro uh, plant and fish processing sanitation, uh, some people actually, they don't want to deal with the uh, food safety issues. Uh, they, instead of using edible plants, they are using ornamental plants. Then they don't have to deal with the um, food safety. So they are following, so following GMPs and gaps might help and also post-harvest sanitation. These are the overall uh, preventive controls that we can have have in an aquaponic system or any food processing system for reducing the pathogenic bacteria prevalence. Um, we actually have been working on food safety plan for different aquaponics uh, companies during the last uh, couple of years. And uh, food safety plan, there is a difference between food safety plan and HACCP. So technically a food safety plan consists of the primary documents or written documents in a preventive controls food safety system, 
which can provide a systematic approach to identify, prevent, and control the food safety hazards in a system. And the goal uh, of using the food safety plan is reducing the chance of someone getting sick from the food material. Um, the food safety plan must be prepared or have already been prepared and needs to be implemented as a written document in a food safety, in, in a food pr processing plant. And it should be uh, developed by the PCQI, Preventive Controls Qualified Individuals. Um, technically, we have seven uh, sections when we are developing the food safety plan. So uh, we need to have a written hazard analysis, pretty similar to the HACCP. We need to develop the preventive controls for each hazard analysis uh, for processed food allergens and sanitation. Uh, develop, we need to develop supply chain program, recall plan, and procedure for monitoring the implementation of the preventive controls, uh, corrective actions, and verification pro uh, procedures. And the FSP or food safety plan is a document and is a record which must re maintain in the properly and we need to keep it uh, available in the food safety, in, in a uh, food safety document. Um, there are always three questions when we are developing the food safety plan. Uh, who develops the FSP, what should be done, and how should it be done. So uh, technically the PCQI is the one who is uh, developing the FSP, and this person doesn't necessarily need to work for the company. It can be hired uh, as a kind of consultant and develop this and oversee that and provide it for the company. But when the first time we develop the FSP or whenever that we make some modification on that, the owner, operator, and agent uh, that they are working in the, who they are working in that company, they need to sign that and apply it. And we need to have a record of that. Uh, there are different types of documents, requirements, and HACCP uh, when we are working with the uh, FSP. So uh, I'm not going to go through the type of documents and the HACCP. I will be focusing on the requirements a little bit here. Uh, so I will be talking about the worker health and hygiene training, sanitation facilities, and water in next couple of slides, just to give you some examples of uh, how we develop the uh, food safety plan for uh, for a kind of, uh, for a food company. Um, so for example, when we are developing uh, the health and the hygiene, we need to make sure that we are uh, addressing the injuries and illnesses. We need to have a preventive control. And we need, whenever that it happens, we need to seek the medical attention. And if the person uh, is ready to go back to the work, uh, they need to have the permission to return to the work. So, and I think during the COVID right now, we will have more restrictions at this moment and more uh, measure controls for bringing sick people or uh, cured people to the, uh, to the work. So for hygiene, we have different components. Uh, for example, food should be actually, we need to provide a specific area for eating food, um, following the gaps and GMPs and following the GMPs to, uh, like don't bring the uh, jewelries, watches or any uh, type of uh, uh, external material to the processing plant, ha proper hand washing, all of these actually need to be addressed when we are developing the FSP. Uh, for sanitation, different schedules, who, when, what, and what type of sanitizers are being used, what is the procedure, how they are cleaning the surface, uh, they, they need to be addressed and storage of the chemicals also needs to be addressed. Uh, same thing for the facility. The, there are different parts of the facility uh, uh, and there are concerns with them like uh, screens, doors, drains, lights and toilets. They need to be addressed and uh, proper preventive control and uh, corrective actions need to be Develop for each of them. Um, like uh, Dr. Strong explained the water uh, for a uh, food safety plan, if the water source is from the city, annual checkup, uh, 
would might be enough. Well water at least annually, and surface water three times per year would be enough for uh, FSP. Um, so some some facilities they have has a plan and they don't want to deal with the FSP. So uh, technically, if they are satisfied with their HASA plan and the HASA plan is com uh, comprehensive and can cover everything, that would be enough. And if they want to develop more documents, they can develop recall plan and uh, supply chain program and add to the HASA plan. And there is no specific format for FSP. It's pretty, uh, uh, flexible, any format works, and there are many teaching examples available uh, through different extension program all around the United States. And we have one example for aquaponics, uh, which can be used for different uh, aquaponics system uh, through the VS, uh, uh, VSE. Uh, so, and uh, it's very dynamic. Um, so whenever uh, that is needed, we can make some changes. Usually people, they make, they revisit that every uh, three years. Uh, whenever that we have new equipment or system, new people on board, new information about the potential hazard or unanticipated food uh, safety problem. So we can go back always and check that and make some changes. Uh, it's pretty dynamic and there are differences between FSP and HACCP. I'm not going to go through all of the details here, but as you can see, there are differences. I just brought this here. If you want to go through that uh, later, you can use that. I will share the slides with Dr. Crosby. So, um, and um, technically there are different types of uh, FSP for different processing plants. So, uh, we, uh, in 2018, in collaborating with other uh, experts from other institutions, we were able to develop a comprehensive document for a uh, food safety plan for an aquaponic system. And uh, so we developed this, and this document is in 79 pages. It is available and it covers different types of aquaponic system, including the couple and one loop aquaponic system for the production part and multi-loop or decoupled aquaponic system. And we have uh, uh, FSP for processing the fish and for processing the lettuce. That's an example. Uh, this is a typical food safety plan. So this is for the fish culturing in a decoupled and coupled aquaponic system. Uh, we have the processing sp uh, step, potential hazards and preventive controls for each step and for each potential hazard. Uh, we have uh, uh, fish processing for live fish, uh, fish processing for different types of fish, whole fish, bled or uh, cleaned. And for lettuce cultivation, lettuce processing, all of the information are avail is, is available uh, in this document if you want to go through and use that. This is an example and pretty much uh, we try to cover uh, different types of aquaponic system uh, which can be used as a model for other uh, processing plant or aquaponic system. So uh, we have been talking about the sanitizer since we have a little bit of time. I just wanted to talk about our program here at Virginia Tech. We are working on different sanitizers. Uh, we are working with activated water. We applied that uh, successfully and we were able to uh, have come, uh, full reduction of different types of pathogenic bacteria. We recently started working with nanobubbles for aquaculture and aquaponics system. And uh, this nanobubble technology works perfectly for removing uh, biofilms. And we applied that for a real aquaponics system. We have an aquaponics system. It's been uh, set up almost 12 months, 18 months ago. And, and uh, we took water from the 
real aquaponics system and um, conducted our research. We've got very interesting results. As you can see here, we have, uh, we have uh, complete reduction of biofilms for E. coli and uh, Listeria inocua and Vibrio parahemolyticus uh, on different surfaces at different time, time of uh, exposure. And we use uh, uh, plant-based material for inactivating pathogenic bacteria in water and using the UVA light or LED, which, which are being used for uh, aquaponics system for plant part. And we got very interesting results. We had complete reduction of Ripioparamyliticus and uh, more than three log reduction for Aeromonas hydrophila. So we use aquaponics water and we had uh, compared that to the uh, control and we had complete reduction for Vibrio paramyliticus for control. And it was pretty close. I mean, we had more than six log reduction for uh, Vibrio paramyliticus in an aquaponic water. We didn't filter. It was turbid with organic load. We were able to kill the bacteria easily using UVA and uh, plant-based uh, antimicrobial component. And also we use nanobubbles for killing bacteria in uh, aquaponics water using nanobubble and ultrasound and we had complete uh, reduction or a full reduction, more than six lug reduction uh, after 10 minutes exposure of bacteria and cell suspension to different uh, uh, regimes, including nanobubble and ultrasound. So, um, yeah, so I try to uh, provide information as much as I could. If you are uh, interested to learn more about these uh, technologies or learn more about the uh, food safety plan, so please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. Hey, Doc, there's a question in the chat box. Do you happen to have a link to that uh, handbook that you showed? Um, page, I believe, 76 of the 79 pages of? Sure. Yes, I will copy the link into the presentation and I will share the presentation with uh, Dr. Crosby or I can share that right now. Uh, yeah, I think I put the link in the box for okay. everybody. Right. Thank you, Dr. Strong. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Cause because I was going to say that's an extension publication, so you should be able to get it from the uh, extension publication at Virginia Tech. Okay, we're going to move right along with Dr. Kim. We're going to have him talk about some of the research we've been doing at Virginia State on these small systems. Um, Dr. Kim, it's all yours. Or did I go in? Are you able to see my screen? No. Yeah, I can see your screen. Just make it full full screen if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Do away with next slide. Just go to full slide, please. Okay. Uh, full slide. How about this? Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you. Sorry, uh, technical issues like you know, always as always. <laughs> All right. Anyway, again, I'm Chai Yun Kim, working at the Virginia State University. Okay, you know, the, most of all, big thanks for inviting me to this food safety for aquaponics and hydroponics session. Well, the Today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what kind of research we are doing in the food safety and microbiology program related to aquaponics and hydroponics research. So, um, the topic I'm presenting today is a part of USDA project. So, you know, that 
is about the aquaponics and the hydroponics production in Virginia and proof of concept generally recognized as safe intervention against potential risks. Why this topic was proposed? Because, I mean, if you are following what's going on in the world these days, we have a huge problem, <laughs> which we never thought about before it's going to happen in real world. Not, you know, we thought just it happens in movies only. But because of that, lots of people are concerned about food that they are consuming and where they buy. So most of all, the U.S. Census in 2018 indicate that approximately 80% of Americans live in urban areas. Because of that democratic demographic changes and the food insecurity associated with urbanization, urban agriculture, including aquaponics and hydroponics has been gaining attention for its health, environmental, economic benefits and increased food security for urban populations. Furthermore, domestic farmer groups are interested in small and mid-scale aquaponics and hydroponics production to satisfy the local and regional demand for safe, high-quality fresh produce and aquaculture products. However, potential implications of food safety in aquaponics and hydroponics systems are not well established, especially in Virginia. So now, why a food safety and microbiologist came up with this project? In other words, why does food safety matter? Because foodborne illness in the U.S. alone impacted 48 million Americans per year and 128,000 hospitalization, 3,000 deaths, and cost billions of dollars, as you see here. I just did not make these stories up. You can find this information from this website. So therefore, this project is to assess microbial quality in current aquaponics and hydroponics production in the Commonwealth of Virginia and develop a generally recognized as safe, environmental friendly intervention method for aquaponic systems. And finally, to enhance local food safety compliance to Food and Drug Administration Food Safety Modernization Act. As Dr. Strong well addressed about what the FISMA is, and she explained everything, but to re-emphasize what is FISMA is, FISMA is transforming the nation's food safety system by shifting the focus from responding to foodborne illness to preventing it. In other words, FISMA rules are designed to make clear, specific actions that must be taken to prevent contamination. So what do we do you know, with this project? So how we do this project is we are acquiring samples from fresh produce and water, tank film interface, biofilter and the fish skin swabs from different locations you know, of aquaculture, aquaculture and the hydro, aquaponics and the hydroponics farming systems in Virginia. And we analyze for water quality, microbial quality and the fish health. And finally, we also want to use group of concept pathogen biocontrol methods such as probiotics to control any potential you know, risks associated with those products. And what and then what we find with from this study we will also provide stakeholders with findings through fact sheets and then newsletter articles so that we can educate you know the stakeholders, you know, including me and you know, others as well. So prior to or before the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, P 
petrified us. We have done, we have you know, visited five schools and the three residential areas and one correctional facility. We were trying to go there, I mean, you know, some other places more, but you know, they were reluctant to you know, receive us. So you know, that's the kind of situation we are in. But we you know, have collected you know, pretty good numbers of you know, the, the samples. So this is a representative, representative picture of aquaponic systems at a school. This slide shows that. that and then next slide is another picture of the representative hydroponic systems at the school. During sample acquisition, I was told by the you know, collaborating teachers that the school cafeteria used the products produced from the school aquaponics and hydroponic systems. So they are pretty you know, confident about the quality of their products. And then this is this slide shows a picture of aquaponic systems at a, a residential area, and then another one also shows that one too. But this one, we you know went to the right time at you know right place. As you see, they got pretty good amount of crops, you know, letters, plants, materials, and this is a uh, you know picture of aquaponic systems at the Department of Correctional Facility. So we, you know, for this one, like, you know, we missed the prime time so that we don't, we, we don't have the good crops in this order. But I think I, when I was listening to Dr. Ovisi's presentation, he had similar, you know, photo like this, but he had the crops, you know, fortunately on top of that, uh, you know, the plastic barrels here. So, you know, the correction, correctional facilities, they have all tilapia growing in these barrels of water. And then, you know, supposedly crops supposed to grow on top of this rack. So, yeah. And this is another representative picture of hydroponic systems at the Department of you know, Correctional Facility. So, of course, you know, pretty good size of the facility and, you know, like tomatoes here, but it's kind of a little you know, out of the season, you know, past the season, so, you know, but, uh, you know, they, of course, they use this, you know, the products for feeding inmates. And this is uh, aquaponic systems at Virginia State University, corporate extension, you know, one of the examples, and then this is uh, this slide shows a very simplified aquaponic system that we have at Virginia State University Corporate Extension. So this is a general you know background information I have had so far. So now let's get to the results. What we found from the samples we have collected from different sites. So here, <clears throat> as you see. You know, the data shows the water quality of the, you know, the samples we have collected from different sites. So the recommended range for parameters of pH, alkalinity and hardness, nitrogen dioxide, total ammonia and temperature should be this range. However, interestingly, most of places where we got samples from was off or off from, you know, the off range of pH, a little bit higher. And then what's the most interesting thing was their hardness is way higher than the recommended range, like 530 or 344. So it is, you know, somewhat concerning. And then Total ammonia content was a little bit, you know, the, a little bit higher than the recommended range as well. And the microbial quality. So before I talk about microbial quality, you will see we got pretty good numbers of samples because because of multiple multiple sampling site at each facility, sample numbers are much higher than numbers of facilities that were that we visited. 
So here, microbial general total microbial count was like about eight logs, so it's you know pretty high. But you know, because so assuming that the water has not been never disinfected or sanitized at all, and then produce microbial count was you know like about eight logs as well, and then and then. Uh, the assumptive bacteria we have we recovered or you know detected from the food materials are like E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella, Eremonas. But again, this is these are assumptive data, you know. So the you know, confirmation are still in progress in my lab. But from this microbial quality data, most interesting thing. You know, striking thing, as a matter of fact, we found was from the hydroponics system, which had some produce E. coli, like about 33% of produce we have tested had this much of E. coli, you know, prevalence, you know, the presence of E. coli. So assuming that probably, you know, good agricultural practices or good handling practices were not followed. I guess because of you know, and then also water quality. But in the, in, interestingly, water didn't have any you know, we didn't detect any E. coli at all. So obviously, people who are handling produce may be may be the concern. But, so that's what we found so far, due to the, probably due to you know the cross contamination. So that's the just just the general you know the result we have found the data we have found then you know based on you know with with this information what are we going to do what are next of course because we need more samples to get better understanding of aquaponics and the hydroponic systems in virginia because of the sample size we have or well, not that many so we cannot confidently say that you know this is the real situation where we you know what's happening so you know, I am soliciting, taking a but taking this opportunity. You know, please, you know, if you happen to know any aquaponics or hydroponics farmers who are interested in analyzing their products, please have them contact me or let me know. You know, of course, the testing will be done for free. And please spread the words that I will be more than happy to collect samples from farmers in this area. Of course, confidentiality is the foremost priority in our business as well. So, so next, with that, you know, so assuming that we have that much of concern, so we want to validate, validate biocontrol of fish pathogens using proof of concept generally recognized as safe probiotics. So. Here we have uh, some kind of episode about this project I was involved in. One, you know, Georgia farmer, you know, the, was calling me and asking me. He had a concern of his quails because he has a uh, like high mortality rate of quails infected with, you know, black mold aspergillus. So he, he, at the same time, you know, coincidentally, I was working on another project with, uh, you know, the food. The, the company just introduced you know, probiotics. You know, they were trying to commercialize these products and they did doing all kinds of genetical analysis, everything. So I introduced each other and then what they, you know, in our lab scale, what we did was we inoculated eggs with black mold and then we treated them with uh, probiotics. So these are the examples of the eggs infected with you know, the black mold, and obviously they are growing. And then these ones are not; these ones are infected with the Aspergillus black mold and treated with probiotics, clean, not single spore at all. But this this is a kind of different, you know, the setting of study we have done. That one too. So that was kind of interesting so you know you know i introduced I, and, and then i reported what i found to both of them so they were so excited and then as far as i understand that the quail house farmer now he is spraying probiotics into his farm and then he was so happy with it so 
you know, that was when I heard from him like about a year ago. So about two years ago. So, you know, I, I you know, at, I haven't checked upon him afterwards. So, but probably he's happy. If he, he was not happy, probably he would at, yell at me and calling me and probably said a lot of stories, but uh, I never heard anything from him, you know, after. So I think he's not happy with me. And then this is uh, another, you know, the close, you know, the close up of that photo. So this is a probiotics and then here black mold, obviously, you know, the clear inhibition zone surrounding probiotics on the plates are showing. So this kind of findings we can provide to stakeholders so that this, there are some potential intervention method because uh, lots of people are concerned about you know the you know the preservatives or chemicals or chlorines or like you know so you know this is a uh, you know more you know the organic I would say and then safe to be used because obviously you know everybody consume the yogurt as a source of probiotics so you know that's another you know the potential there. So what do we expect from, from this, you know, project deck? So from this project, we are expecting scientific water quality and microbial quality information on the food products produced through aquaponics and the hydroponic systems in Virginia and improve local food safety outcomes by training stakeholders and increasing their ability to comply with the FDA FISMA regulations. Therefore, consumer confidence in locally grown products produced through aquaponics and hydroponic systems and the contribution to security of the food supply in Virginia at least. How can we do that? I know the you know the the Dr. Obesi the you know the explained and described it very well and the Dr. Strong also you know, addressed very well as well. So most of all, the you know good agricultural and hand handling practice practices, where your samples are coming from, or you know plant seedlings like you know fish, food particularly, and, and the clean water source. Plants should not be in the same tank as fish. Filter water from fish tank. No direct contact of fish tank water with the edible portion of crop. So. I reiterate that because that's the most important thing where you know you you are you know samples are coming from or seedlings are coming from. And then also depending upon you know how you feel about, but the thing is, you know, like every season or you know, every six month water, you know, the microbial quality test, but I guess depending upon you know how you interpret the situation or result, but now I was thinking about, you know, I think this based upon other some references they were talking about, you know, microbial and water quality testing needs to be done at least monthly, monthly, and then prevent cross contamination using separate tools and equipment and personal hygiene, hygiene like you saw in, in our data from the, you know, the fresh produce obtained from the hydroponic systems didn't have any contact with aquaponics like you know fish or any other fecal material but obviously had the E. coli so it was coming from somewhere so you know maybe I assume it may be the personal hygiene and they use clean tools and the store products at appropriate temperatures here uh, you know like we know the basics but sometimes what we miss is this the you know most of products when we harvested from the field don't have like uh, high levels of microbial counts which is you know, highly unlikely you will get you know infected by that number of microorganisms and then you will get sick and then you know like that kind of you know get unexpected result or anything but the thing is how we handle it that's the thing that you know, let me share some, you know, one example from the story. The, the, you know, let's say, you know, the weather, like a, the 
we are getting close to fall, very cool season. It's really nice, and even you're out there, and then, you know, it's like about, let's say, 5 p.m., and then you're about to wrap up, you know, that call it a day. And then on the way home, you, you are called by your, you know, wife, and then she wanted to have some kind of good, you know, the, you know, sweet, you know, honeydew. So, okay, yeah, I, I can do everything for you. So, you know, on the way home, you picked up, you know, like one honeydew, good ripen, and it smells sweet, very sweet. And then, coincidentally, a, a friend of yours called you, a long lost friend, and called you, hey, man, you know, you know like the daylight is still long. You know, why don't we play like a short purple, like, you know, nine holes or something? And you just couldn't refuse it. So, you have that, uh, you know, honeydew is well ripened on is in, in your back, you know, of your car while you are playing your, you know, short nine holes. And then when you get home, you, you know, gladly or happily hand that, uh, you know, that uh, the product to your wife and the here is for you. But uh, think about at the beginning, the number of microorganisms, the level of microorganisms, when you picked up at the store, the honeydew it may have just like a small number of, let's say, E. coli whatsoever. But in your, you know, car during that time period while you are enjoying your, you know, company, you know, playing golf, that number significantly grows up to the level where people get sick. So that's the kind of a basic concept we need to think about all the time what we do so always remember I mean some of you maybe not be aware of like a fat time like a food acidity temperature time moisture oxygen oxygen moisture those are the six parameters you know bacteria will need to grow so as far as you Go with that six parameters and try to, you know, mitigate or, you know, like intervene those six parameters. You know, you, I think you will be in pretty good shape. Again, fat, tom, F as in food, A as in acidity, like a pH, and then T as in temperature, another T as in time, and the O as in oxygen, M as in moisture. So, so. With that, again, you know, but the most of important thing is I'd like to have this disclaimer that due to the limited availability of samples at different facilities, each sample acquired in duplicate may not be representative of all samples in the study area. The authors would like to declare that this study was carried out mainly for academic research purpose without any conflict of interest. And then here are the people involved in this project. And again, I, taking this opportunity, I'd like to thank Dr. Crosby so much for coming out to that, you know, the sampling site every time. You know, I do respect you all. Thank you so much. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thanks. You know, the, that's been one of the uh, biggest uh, hurdles for us is to uh, locate all these small aqua, aquaponic units that's out there. Uh, we've been, uh, everybody's been interested in these units. We have a lot of attendance to it, but trying to uh, locate and get a database of, of folks who are doing this has been fairly difficult for us. Uh, uh, this is time now to ask some questions. If you have any questions of our presenters, please uh, ask right now. We can go for a few more minutes to do that. Well, Mark uh, just put in the Qualtrics survey. So uh, if you all will do a quick evaluation, we'd appreciate that as well. Okay. It's in the chat box. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? I think all the questions we've had thus far, Doc, have been uh, answered uh, that I have been able to find. So we've got 
the link is in there for the uh, booklet is also in the chat box uh, so those are there as well